From April 2015 through to March 2018, Trevor Heitman, also known as McSkillet, became one of CSGO's most notorious YouTubers. Garnering almost 1 million subscribers while making over $4 million in 10 months, it appeared as if not even the sky could limit him. But following a drastic change to the online gambling scene and a very sudden shift in his mental health, Trevor's personal story would fall from hero to zero. And his final actions would leave McSkillet as one of CSGO's most hated influencers. Welcome back to Coffeehouse Crime, folks. My name is Adrian, and in today's video, we're looking at the case of McSkillet. By the way, I post solved, unsolved, and strange cases here on a weekly basis, so if you're interested, please consider subscribing to Coffeehouse Crime. And with that said, let's begin today's video. Grab a coffee, pull up a seat, and sit back. This is the case of McSkillet. Welcome to San Diego, California. Found in the southwest corner of the United States, California's beach city is found right next to the border of Mexico. Of course, this means San Diego has some incredible food. And this goes hand in hand with its warm climate, beautiful beaches, and inspiring parks. And it's here, in the idyllic suburb of Carmel Valley, that we find the Heitman family. We're focusing this story on one of their sons, Trevor Heitman. Trevor, or Baby McSkillet, was born on February the 18th in the year 2000. And growing up alongside his sister, he was the son of Kurt Heitzman and mother Beta Heitzman. We don't know too much about Trevor's early childhood, but his family described him to be quiet, well-mannered, and of good character. And despite his tall stature, Trevor was the reserved type. While growing up, Trevor attended La Jolla Country Day School. He held an interest in basketball, and although he would never reach varsity level, he won multiple awards within the novice bracket. Looking back at Google Street View, you can see the basketball hoop on his driveway. But as we approach the year 2015, this basketball hoop would disappear. By the time Trevor had reached his mid-teens, his interest veered towards video games, and his basketball games outside with his friends would eventually stop. But Trevor was becoming popular in other areas of his life instead. Brandishing the name of McSkillet Online, he had started playing Counter-Strike Global Offensive, also known as CSGO. Now, CSGO is a typical first-person shooter game, but one of the game's key elements which drew Trevor to playing CSGO was their skins feature. Okay, so bear with me here, as this is a very important aspect to this case. Skins are, essentially, cosmetic styles for weapons in a game. They don't actually do anything to make you better in the game, it's just for aesthetic preference. But one of the things you could do with these weapon skins was collect and trade with other players. Most of these skins were common, but some were rarer than others. And essentially, this made a financial ecosystem within CSGO. It was in April of 2015 that Trevor or McSkillet uploaded his very first video to YouTube, named Top 10 Most Expensive Skins in CSGO. What's going on everyone, this is McSkillet here, and today I'm going to be showing you guys the Top 10 Most Expensive and Most Rare Skins for CSGO. And this list might not, it might not be 100% accurate just because there's so many different variations for some of these knives, but I tried to make the most accurate list I could. So without further ado, the top 10 most expensive and most rare skins for CSGO. Now, Trevor was a very smart kid. This type of video simply did not exist on YouTube at the time. And although there were many people who were interested in rare skins, it required hours of manual research to find the best. It is no surprise that his YouTube channel took off. He had essentially found himself a very sweet spot in the market. There was a high demand for his content, with a very low supply. Trevor was also a very analytical young man, and to add to this, he had a very palatable personality. Now add collaborations to the mix, and you can see why he grew to almost 1 million subscribers. So, over the years, and as the CSGO community developed, so did McSkillet. Skins became a core part of the game's ecosystem, and of course, this favoured him greatly. With that came trading, and of course, gambling. Spending money to buy loot boxes or packages, which in return will give you random skins. Some of which are rare, and extremely expensive. At the age of 16, McSkillet began to get sponsors from CSGO gambling sites like CSGO Wild and CSGO Strong. And as his notoriety grew, so did their payments. By the year 2017, he took his business ventures up a notch. Instead of being sponsored by CSGO gambling sites, he decided to make his own. And by November of 2017, he had created his third and final website, CSGO Magic. 
Muxkillet would pull a lot of traffic from his YouTube channel to his own website, and in response, this made him a lot of money. It's estimated that from April 2015 through to December 2017, he had made over $10 million through his ventures, with approximately $4 million in the most recent 10 months alone. In December of 2017, Muxkillet showed off his new baby, a McLaren 650S. Alright, what's going on guys, Mixkillage here with another video, but today I thought I would switch it up and just do a real life video. This is actually my car, now it's not actually like my new car because I've had it for a few months now, but yeah, this car has 641 horsepower and it beats just about every single other supercar in a drag race. And I'm not, not talking about like hypercars like Porsche 918 Spider. Yeah, this car is pretty damn insane, it's got a twin turbo V8, so once the turbos kick in, you just have so much power it's ridiculous. And if you're wondering how I was able to afford this car, well, at the time I bought it, my sources of income were just uh, Skin.Trade, I owned that site, and then sponsored CSGO gambling videos and some other sponsorships of like Gameflip, but it was mainly Skin.Trade because that's what I used to make a ton, and then I did make a pretty good amount from gambling sponsorships. Throughout these two and a half years, Muck Skillet had climbed to become one of CSGO's most iconic names. He had garnered a massive community, built multiple successful businesses, and had made a lot of money in the process. Safe to say, he was doing incredibly well. Trevor also kept in shape with a personal trainer at his local gym, Crunch Fitness, which is actually where this image was taken. On March the 20th, 2018, and unbeknownst to him at the time, Trevor posted what would be his last video on YouTube. To be honest, there's nothing special to it, and it held no clues or concerns to his incoming catastrophe. But the reason it would be his final video was because his career was about to suddenly end. Muxkillet's rise and this video was posted in the middle of the loot box controversy, in which gambling in video games was becoming problematic to children and adults all across the globe. So on March the 29th, 2018, it was no surprise to see Valve update their CSGO game guidelines with a means to target skin gambling sites. And this of course would lead to the end of Muxkillet's own website, CSGO Magic. Now, players could still trade skins, but only after a cooldown period of 7 days. And in addition to these measures, Muxkillet's own personal inventory was also banned due to his link with gambling bots. With a personal inventory worth over $100,000, and his business empire now almost entirely dead in the water, Muxkillet had essentially lost all of his future endeavours. That is not to say that he couldn't restart, or start something new with his 900,000 subscribers, but this would have taken a lot of time and effort to do so. Ultimately, McSkillet felt defeated. In response to the update, McSkillet faded into the background. He retired from the CSGO skin community, even saying this on his Twitter bio. Now, again, McSkillet had a lot to celebrate. He may have lost his former sense of purpose and his usual way of making money, but he still had a lot of money in the bank and a huge community to build something new with. He did actually allude to a few new projects over the following months, but for the most part, he fizzled out of existence, and with Trevor being a very private man, we don't know much of what happened in his personal life. But only a few months later, Trevor would come back in the spotlight for an entirely different reason. On August the 18th, Trevor's behaviour had noticeably changed. He told his parents that he thought he was experiencing a meltdown, and he began to act erratically and carelessly. In addition to this, he had actually told his mother that he'd driven his McLaren 150 miles per hour in a 25 mile per hour zone, all while going the wrong direction. Trevor's father asked him what he thought would happen if the police had caught him, in which Trevor responded with, neither the police or their bullets could hurt me. These concerns would heighten when Trevor later cried to his parents, claiming yet again that he was having a breakdown, and this issue wouldn't get any better. Just five days later, on August the 23rd, at approximately 8.13am, a neighbour and friend of the Heitman family, named Mary Rusher, urgently called 911. Mary was a board-certified psychiatrist, and she was well experienced in her field, and she was concerned over Trevor's mental health. Hello, 911. I'm calling to report an emergency. I believe there's an individual who is a danger to himself and a danger to others. I do believe that he is suffering from a mental illness and that he should be detained on a 5150 for further observation. Twelve minutes after this phone call, police officers arrived at the Heitman residence, where Trevor's parents were eagerly awaiting to speak to them. Who bought the car for him? He bought it. He bought it? 
Is he bought him a McLaren? Millions of dollars, yeah. At 18 years old? He's a very intelligent kid. He made $4 million in 10 months. Okay. Oh. So, his he's got to teach plan. me his ways. Not right now. <laughs> yeah. So, what do you want us to do? Uh, take him for a psychological evaluation. I mean, he's got to meet certain criteria, though. They were still deeply concerned over their son's behavior. He's, he's got manic behavior. He's never been diagnosed. Which, I, he needs to go into a doctor. He should be held on a 5150. Okay, but he has to meet criteria, criteria, though. I mean, he's a danger to himself. How is that? Well, let me ask you, are you his psychiatrist? I am not. Have you ever seen him? I have not. In any professional setting? No. Okay. Trevor, who was currently asleep in his bedroom, was clearly under some form of mental relapse. He had been screaming at his parents throughout the morning, and while making paranoid and delusional statements, he had even threatened to harm his mother. Beta described the behaviour of an extremely delusional man, and some of those details which he shared with officers were very concerning. Trevor believed that, if he travelled at a high enough speed, and in the opposite direction, he would be able to drive his McLaren through any other vehicle without any incident. Now, on a personal note, this is a very jarring thought to me. McSkillet loved CSGO, and anyone who plays these games knows about clipping, where you essentially travel through solid objects in the game. And this does beg the question, was Trevor confusing game mechanics with reality? Trevor also claimed that apparently, his sister was in the room with him and stalking him, when in reality, she wasn't even in the property. Unfortunately, San Diego Police Department felt like they had no authority to detain Trevor, as, quite simply, he had not broken any laws. In their body cam footage, Trevor's McLaren can be seen in the garage, and behind it, Kurt parked his rented SUV perpendicularly across the driveway, as a precaution to block Trevor's McLaren from leaving. The discussion between officers, Trevor's parents, and Dr. Russia was a very clear point of contention in this case. Court documents highlight that the family had pleaded for officers to exercise PERT duties, also known as Psychiatric Emergency Response Team. These duties include completing an evaluation of a person who is experiencing a mental health crisis, and, as appropriate, make a referral and or transport to a treatment facility. Responding officers asked Dr. Russia if she was Trevor's treating physician. She told them that she was a family friend and not Trevor's healthcare provider, but she reiterated that in her professional opinion as a board-certified psychiatrist, Trevor's mental state necessitated that the officers detain him on a section 5150 hold. Californian Welfare and Institution Code 5150 allows an adult who is experiencing a mental health crisis to be involuntarily detained for a 72-hour psychiatric hospitalization. This is, of course, if they are evaluated, for example, through PERT, and deemed to be a danger to their self or others, or gravely disabled. Now, despite the group's justified pleas for assistance, and Dr. Rush's professional input, the officers still refused to enter the house to evaluate. And instead of conducting these duties, they suggested to Beta that she should stay out of her own house until she could formally evict Trevor by filing a civil restraining order. The officers also added that this process would take approximately one month. With the agreement, Kurt and Dr. Russia then entered Trevor's bedroom. However, Trevor began to scream at Dr. Russia. With his mouth gaping wide open, he began to make incomprehensible noises before lunging at and insulting her. Again, officers claimed they could not perform pert duties or take Trevor into custody, as he hadn't committed any confirmed crime at the time. Seeing that the intervention was not going to happen, the Heitman family thanked officers for their time before allowing them to leave. In good faith, Kurt told the officers that he'd take his son to the hospital late that day, and apparently, Trevor even agreed to this idea. The officers nodded, and eventually left without any further action. And tragically, due to the lack of intervention from officers, or anyone else for that matter, this would lead to catastrophic consequences. At approximately 4.15pm, Trevor Heitman stormed out of his bedroom and told his parents he had to go. Before they had any time to react, he got behind the wheel of his McLaren and rammed his father's SUV to get out of the driveway. Just several minutes later, at approximately 4.23pm, he rammed his McLaren through the fence of Ashley Falls Elementary School. He then proceeded to drive recklessly in and around the school parking lot. You know you're driving in a school zone, right? Trevor then allegedly got out of the vehicle, smashed a window, and then returned to his car, where he was then confronted by school staff. Something's wrong 
Fortunately, due to the time of the year, the school was not in session. However, children can still be seen running away to keep clear of his vehicle. He's coming back! He's coming back! Hi! You have a crazy ass on your campus right now driving in a sports car, chasing after the kids! I mean, there is a crazy ass! Call 911 right now! Trevor then rammed his way out of the school. By 4.30pm, Trevor had reached the southbound I-5 freeway, where he was then involved in a hit-and-run incident. And although no one was seriously injured in the event, it left many others shaken. At 4.31pm, police dispatch logs confirmed that Trevor's father, Kurt, called 911. He claimed that Trevor was in a manic state, had hit his and his own vehicle, and fled the property. He again highlighted that Trevor needed serious help. And only six minutes later, Kurt's concerns would erupt into a full-blown reality. At approximately 4.35pm, Trevor Heitman travelled in the wrong direction, up an exit ramp from the 805 freeway. Due to its elevation, incoming traffic had no way of seeing Trevor's McLaren, and climbing to speeds of over 100 miles per hour in his sports car, one slight miscalculation would hold grave consequences. Reaching Junction 27A, he was now throttling past incoming traffic at speeds of over 100 miles per hour. And with the risk being both so great and so dangerous, he would not make it far either. At 4.36pm, Trevor's McLaren drove head-on into a Hyundai SUV. This collision killed Trevor instantly. The force of impact was so great that his torso was transected by a seatbelt, and several of his body parts were ejected onto the freeway. Sadly, this story gets a lot worse. The Hyundai SUV that Trevor had collided with came with two passengers. Two innocent people, now the consequential victims to his own actions. A loving 43-year-old mother named Eileen Pizarro was driving her 12-year-old daughter when they both met their untimely end. Eileen came from a background of love and nurture. She was a family therapist who provided support and guidance to previously abused children. Her son described her as a selfless mother who put her family before herself, and at the time of her death, she was training to become a licensed therapist. An important note for later, but she was also a huge fan of Dwayne Johnson. And sadly, Eileen leaves behind two sons. In the passenger seat, her 12-year-old daughter, Ariana, was the youngest to lose her life. Born in the year 2006, she was only days away from her first day in 7th grade. Ariana was a self-described brainiac. She loved to read, listen to music, and, above all else, she loved to sing. She regularly sang with her brothers, or solo, at small community events around Santa Monica. Her voice travelled far and wide in the local community, but sadly, no more. According to Trevor's autopsy report, there were no drugs or alcohol found within his body at the time of his death. He had no medical history of depression, no suicidal thoughts or previous attempts, and no documented diagnosis of a mental illness either. Furthermore, Trevor was straight edge. He was not known to smoke, use illegal drugs, or even drink alcohol, and there was no suicidal note left behind either. Police officers looking into this case were at first baffled by his actions. There was no obvious motive or aggravating factor from the outset, and of course, this would lead to speculation. As the world learned of McSkillet's death, and the two lives which he took with him, public opinions over his actions would very quickly heat up and polarise. In fact, McSkillet became an extremely hated individual. Not hundreds, but tens of thousands of comments can be found all over his videos, brandishing him a selfish murderer who should have taken his own life quietly. But scratching past the surface and looking at court documentation suggests an entirely different reason to his motives. He was not crying to his parents over suicidal tendencies, he was crying about a mental breakdown. And his final actions are reflected upon his previous delusional thoughts. Trevor Heitman did not want to die. Instead, he believed he could clip through other cars without incident. And although his business empire had collapsed, he was a very level-headed kid who still had tons of money to help him start up again. At the end of the day, we can't be sure what he was thinking, but nothing suggests that he wanted to end his life. 
In fact, the medical examiner's report suggested that he may have been suffering from mania, the same condition casually diagnosed by his board-certified neighbour. Mania is a psychological condition that causes a person to experience unreasonable euphoria, very intense moods, hyperactivity, and delusions. People with mania have a greater risk of experiencing hallucinations and other perceptual disturbances, and they may even engage in more risky behaviours due to these perceptions. It is very likely that Trevor Heitman or McSkillet was experiencing this. Mania can be triggered by a multitude of events, including environmental changes such as stressful events, financial stress, and hormonal or chemical imbalances. McSkillet was under an extreme amount of pressure. At just the age of 18, he had grown to own a multifaceted, multi-million dollar business empire, all of which was now collapsing around him. While riding the highs may have been easy for a hard-working and smart young man, the panic of losing it all would have surely overwhelmed his inexperienced mind. Anxiety can play a huge role to your actions and your decisions, and McSkillet was facing a huge downfall. But nevertheless, his actions are entirely inexcusable. Whether it should have come from law enforcement, his parents, or even himself, medical intervention should have happened much sooner. As a direct consequence are the real victims of today's case. Eileen and Ariana Pizarro lost their lives in the mere blink of an eye. They had no chance and no decision to their demise. One second, it was a typical day, and the very next, they were dead. That moment may not have been long, but the terror they would have felt to see a car hurtling towards them would have been astronomical, and after this moment, the Pizarro family would never be the same again. A loving mother and a talented daughter leave behind many unfinished dreams and promises. Following international outcry, Dwayne Johnson, who Eileen had doted upon, would leave his thoughts and prayers for the Pizarro family. Hey Angelo, um, Dwayne Johnson here, and uh, I had turned on my phone and I saw a flood, thousands and thousands of, uh, of tweets had come through. I just want to say thanks for reaching out, man, and, um, and I'm so sorry to hear about your sister and your mom and this tragic loss that you and your family are going through. Following their deaths, several lawsuits have turned this case into a legal battleground. Where San Diego City blames Trevor's parents for not acting sooner, his parents blame the city police department for not taking their concerns more seriously. The Pizarro family have of course sued both of these parties, as they themselves now seek justice for their irreplaceable loss. This case took a lot of digging and personal research, and a lot of this information isn't easily available. In all honesty, I don't think many people fully understand the story of Trevor Heitman. While the media may have researched this case in the initial aftermath, both time and court documentation have brought more clarity to McSkillet's case. And although I'm not here to form your own opinion, I hope my research can bring more transparency to a story that has so far been left in the dark. Despite no evidence of him reducing his speed or steering away from incoming traffic, Trevor Heitman's case was ultimately deemed an accident. Many argue that this case should at least be considered second degree murder, or at the very least manslaughter. And I have to agree that terming this case as an accident isn't enough. But without proof that McSkillet had acted in malice, it's hard to know where this case legally stands. To wrap up this story, one of the most horrific aspects to this case is the evidence left behind on Google Maps. Where street images prior to this fatal crash resemble nothing significant, those images taken afterwards reveal a charred road, a visible scar, and a grisly reminder to the nightmarish actions of Trevor Heitman. Even to this day, you can still easily spot the location in which three lives were lost. Trevor Heitman's YouTube channel, also known as McSkillet, is still up and running to this very day. Thank you for watching another video today by Coffeehouse Crime. If you found this case interesting or you learned something new today, then please remember to like the video and subscribe if you haven't yet. So what are your thoughts on the case of McSkillet? And I know this story was different to my usual, but did you mind that? Of course, please share your thoughts in the comments section down below. Thank you again for watching folks, and as always, I'll be back again real soon for another video. But until that moment arrives, please remember to look after each other. Goodbye.